Well, welcome everyone. It's great to be out uh, again, out with the crowd, showing it. Um, welcome to the third of this year's 2021 uh, Crowley Lecture Series. There will be more continuing in the springtime. And this, by the way, I think I mentioned last time, I'm not sure, but 20th year we've been doing this. And we have with us tonight, uh, he's here every night, we have these, but in the back somewhere is Dr. John Quinn, who was actually the first briefer that we had in the year 2001. So we're dating us. Great to have you, John. And also with us tonight is Dr. Scott Malloy, who, who has presented many times for us. We're very pleased to have him. And I just want to call your attention to, Scott wrote an article on the 31st of October in the Providence Journal. And uh, I'd like, if you haven't seen it, terrific article on, um, on the Fremantle Six, the group of people that were convicted in Dublin, uh, sentenced to imprisonment in Fremantle, Australia, spent seven years under, sound like very poor conditions, Scott, extremely harsh, spent a year sailing from there to the United States and ended up, it, his name was James McNally Wilson, ended up settling in Central Falls and then Pawtucket. Uh, and last week, November 6th, they had a ceremony up there at his grave site, St. Mary's Church in Pawtucket. And just to connect the dots, which he's done so well for us, the pastor at St. Mary's in Pawtucket, Father Soriel, is coming here this week to become the pastor of St. Mary's Church here in Newport. Great, great timing. Yeah. <laughs> and you do a good job. Yes. Great. For those good. Yeah. Just a couple uh, upcoming events and administrative notes before I turn it over to the important person here, Dr. Deborah Mulligan. Um, on the 7th of December, we will have, which we do each year, uh, a dose and thank you, a thank you reception, light fund for just our docents. But I, I mentioned that here because if we have any docents that for a lot of reasons, COVID being one of them that haven't served this year, we still want to see you there as a way to thank you for your past service, as well as potentially joining us as a docent uh, in the future. So that's Tuesday, the 7th of December at five o'clock at uh, AOH Hall for our docents and the board. Saturday, 11th of December, we will have our annual Christmas open house uh, at the Interpretive Center on Thames Street. Everyone is welcome. Uh, this year will feature our oral histories. Uh, several people even in this, that contributed within this room tell the story of their upbringings in Irish households, be it in the Fifth Ward, uh, Newport County, and one uh, in Cork City, uh, County Cork, and that's Maeve Sheehan, who was born and brought up there. So we'll feature those playing on the wall. And then about, that's from noontime till 4.30, uh, about three o'clock, uh, the men's Hibernian singers will join us. So if you, have, if you have children in the family, grandchildren or neighbors where you can bring the little ones, it's always uh, great listening to the, to the men's singers down there. We'll serve refreshments, uh, cookies, pastries, uh, eggnog with or without, uh, have a little fun. And then we march on down at 4.30 for those that are interested to mass uh, at the AOH Hall. And it's always festive, it's always a nice mass. Father Frank uh, O'Loughlin will be the celebrant this year. He is the chaplain for the Hibernians. So that's 11 December, 12 to 4.30. Mark your calendars, please. We're working right now, we have been for months on Irish walking tours of Newport and we'll feature those in the springtime when we open the Interpreter Center. I'm gonna pass around a couple tonight. These are not the finished copies, but to give you an idea, we have three walking tours of Irish Newport. Uh, this one tonight is the Fifth Ward. Uh, features about 15 to 18 stops, takes about an hour to an hour and a half. 
And we think that's going to increase the museum's footprint uh, in Newport. Um, and I think it's a really a good idea that number two, the second one, uh, which we also have done is uh, Spring Street. Starts up on Spring around Carey School, marches on down past uh, O'Neill Hayes Funeral Home, Galvin's Nursery, on to St. Mary's Church, then Trinity uh, Anglican Church, on down to the Fastnet Pub, stop if you wish, <laughs> up the hill to uh, Toro Synagogue, and then the Barney Street Cemetery. And the third one, the longest one, starts at the hilltop near the Viking Hotel and proceeds down Bellevue past the unsinkable Molly Brown property where the house used to be, the reading room, Commodore Matthew statue, casino, and on down to Ochre Court and eventually past Rosecliff down to Belcourt Castle in Inchiquin. They all have ties to the Irish. And that's about an hour and a half, but it should be an enjoyable walk and self-guided tours. We will have these at the Interpreter Center and likely charge a nominal $2, something like that for printing costs, and that's it. But I'll pass them around so you can take a look. And again, they'll be tri-folded, I believe, so uh, the minutes work with me right now. As many of you know, and I, I just mentioned this, that um, tonight is my probably my last night to address a crowd. Uh, I turn it over at the end of December to uh, Deanna Conheny, our treasurer, who is taking over as uh, president uh, at the end of December. And I just, as I reflect back on it, it's been a wonderful time working with a great board here, just a fabulous board. Uh, I get to stand up here and, and talk for a few minutes they do all the heavy lifting. It's all done by a great board of about 20 people. But when I reflect on the past 12 years, um, I look at the membership growing from around 200 when I first came into the organization to about 800 today. Uh, much of that has to do with these lecture series that Ann and Dan uh, present to us has drawn an awful lot of people. Uh, we've watched also, the, uh, the, the crowd here grow from, John, was it 15 to 30 in the back bar at LaForge when you first started? I, I remember that, yeah. Sitting around a piano there. Um, and uh, the very first one was on Father Matthew, Theobald Matthew and the Temperance Society. And so we've grown from 15 to 20 people to upwards of 200 and sometimes 200 uh, in reserve remotely. So it's very gratifying. And we owe thanks to not only the board, but to all of you that have really so well supported us over these many, many years. And I just, my one ask is that you do the same for Deanna. She will announce the new officers uh, on 1 January that you give the same amount of support. And I'll still be hanging around doing whatever you decide I ought to do. I don't know, you know. Um, but you all have my thanks. And tonight, as you saw the sign earlier, we also want to thank Frank Furtado, one of our longtime members who moved to Oklahoma four years ago that is sponsoring this event tonight. He was an avid St. Mary's supporter on the choir there, um, moved out to be with family in Oklahoma and uh, wanted very much to remain part of this organization. So we thank uh, Frank very much. We are very privileged tonight to have Dr. Deborah with us, Deborah Mulligan. She was here with us last, last month as well, sat in the audience, so it's not her first appearance. She's a Rhode Island native. Uh, she earned both her master's degree and her doctorate degree from Providence College. She is now a history professor at Roger Williams University. She's on the board of the Rhode Island Heritage Hall of Fame, along with Scott Malloy. She's written several books, the most recent being a 2019 book on the political life of J. Howard McGrath, which you'll hear about tonight. She's a frequent community lecturer. 
recently appointed vice president of the National Historical History Honor Society, Phi Alpha Theta, and now working on a manuscript. I can't wait to see this one. Between Two Worlds, the story of Little Italy, 1880 to 1930 in Rhode Island. So. <laughs> And lastly, and most importantly, and I love this, uh, is her students wrote that they think the world of her. If you go down and look at what the students have to say about her, and I think you'll see why in a minute. Dr. Deborah, here you go. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Oops. How's everyone tonight? Are you doing well? Do you like the weather? Yeah, yeah, especially on Saturday when we had a tornado. I thought I was in Kansas, but no, it's Rhode Island. Anyway, first of all, I want to thank everyone for being here tonight. It's a little chilly, but um, for, for coming out and um, for Anne, who has helped me so much uh, prepare for this lecture and um, to the museum for all your warm welcome. Um, and again, I thank you. And um, please, I'll, uh, I'll look forward to your questions after. I had to reread my book because it was been two years, you know? So <laughs> it's like, what did I write? Anyway, um, so first of all, I'll tell you that I first, I didn't know who J. Howard McGrath was. How many of you know who J. Howard McGrath is? Oh, that's awesome. So if I asked that question in 1952, guess, guess how many people would have said, do you know who J. Howard McGrath was? Maybe they wouldn't have wanted to admit it because he had just been fired as attorney general, but that's another story. Anyway, so I'm gonna go back here. Let's see if I can go back here. Okay, here we go. Um, so who was J. Howard McGrath? We uh, shall find out in a minute. And uh, okay. Now, if you happen to drive down in West Greenwich, you hit a J. Howard McGrath federal complex. And that is, I don't know if anyone's ever seen, has anyone ever seen that? It's on the other side of the bridge. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, but anyway, so my brother lives there. I haven't visited yet. No, <laughs> he's only been there 20 years. Anyway, <laughs> but J that is named for J. Howard McGrath. So when I was doing my research, I, um, wanted to find out, because J. Howard McGrath actually was born in Woonsocket in 1903, but he also did a lot of his conniving and other pol political activities in Central Falls. So I called up and asked about, uh, you know, can I come and visit and talk about J. Howard McGrath and sort of look in the, um, you know, the town hall. And they looked at me and they said, oh my God, that's the dude on the wall. I said, <laughs> So I think probably I should do a few more lectures, maybe. <laughs> Nobody knows who the dude on the wall is anymore. Anyway, so I will tell you, um, he conferred with 1928 and 1932 Democratic nominee Al Smith. There he is. Sailed with governor of New York, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Consulted with FBI director J. Edgar Hoover. He was a little shy, I have no picture of him. Uh, campaigned with Postmaster General James Farley and lunched with Harry Truman and his daughter, Margaret. He posed for photo ops with Cary Grant and Myrna Loy, entertained the Duke and Duchess of Windsor and the wrath of Senator Strom Thurmond of South Carolina and the praise of civil rights advocate, Mary McLeod Bethune, appearing weekly sometimes daily in leading newspapers and magazines from 1945 to 1952, Rhode Island governor, US Senator, and Attorney General James Howard McGrath seemed destined for a permanent place in the annals of history. So what happened to him? How did his Irish origins as the son of James J. McGrath guide him through the highs and lows of his career? So this talk is gonna focus on the early years of his life. And I hope you'll ask me questions about the other parts of his life. <laughs> but first, maybe a little background on the Irish, and I'm sure you folks all know this, but I thought I'd set the stage a bit. 
Uh, the plight of the Irish Catholics as represented by the personal journeys of families like the McGraths and the Mays, and that was his maternal ancestors, was woven deeply into the fabric of Rhode Island's social and political makeup. The Irish transported their singular ethnic experience to their new surroundings. Their travel, while communally based, in many ways was also an intensely personal experience. Even before they fled the country of origin following the 1840s potato famine, the Irish on the Western coastal towns from Cork to Donegal had endured unimaginable poverty. The rocky coastlines and barren farmland proved nearly uninhabitable for its unfortunate population as compared to the affluence of the Northern counties such as Ulster. Equally important economic disparity among Protestants and Catholics was pervasive. While Protestants certainly endured a bleak existence, most of the poor in Ireland were Catholic. Thus, the former comprising approximately 10% of the population dominated the social and political fabric of the, count of the country, while the latter, 75% in total, suffered at the hands of wealthy Protestant landlords. Even so, the flight from Ireland would not have occur occurred without the dislocation brought about by the infestation of disease to the potato in the early to mid 19th century. Upon the crop's initial arrival in September 1845, word spread that it was coming out of the rotten, the ground rotten and putrid. By mid season, it became apparent that the damage was widespread, resulting in starvation, desperation, and a dangerous rise in criminal behavior. On the other side of the Atlantic, was the tiny state of Rhode Island, which was transformed into a center of industrial development beginning in the 18th century. The spread of textiles strengthened by the development of steam power and rail travel encouraged migration the century. Its population jumped from 77,000 in 1830 to 174,000 30 years later. Rhode Island's textile trade drew several Irish immigrants to the shores to work in its thriving mills, including men like James J. Patrick and Thomas McGrath. However, Irish Catholicism in the heretofore pro Protestant stronghold alarmed native Rhode Islanders. Their political, social, and economic livelihood they feared would now be bound to these poorly clad newcomers who were ignorant of the state's died in the wall traditions in response, they sought to curb the reform impulse, which swept the country and clung to conservatism as protection against a changing social, political, and economic milieu. So by 1850, the federal census listed at about 16,000 journeymen and women of Irish birth living in Rhode Island. About 69% of the total number of immigrants the former potato farmers settled in crowded tenements and boarding houses of the industrialized cities and mill towns. Attempting to find employment in these unfamiliar surroundings, they gravitated to the mills, where they eked out a meager existence while enduring the effects of virulent nativism. This is a nasty person, just saying. The Rhode Island Constitution, which went into effect in 1843, guaranteed Republican domination in the General Assembly through an onerous clause which retained property qualifications for voting in state and local elections. However, the new Republicans were made up of uh, former nativists, people who did not like immigrants. Um, they were formerly known as the, no you could see the sign of the Know Nothing Party there. We don't want any foreign influence, according to them. Uh, they were made up of former Whigs, who were anti-Andrew Jackson folks, and um, also very nativist, and some rogue de Democrats who adopted this xenophobia or anti-immigrant impulse and became most powerful, the most powerful political entity in the state. Now, Republicanism in the 1850s, of course, would be those who would be a proponent of no spread of slavery. But in Rhode Island, that really 
while we did have a lot of slavery and slavers in Rhode Island, um, by that point, the focus was anti-immigration for many of those who lived in Rhode Island. One of the most virulent of the anti-immigrants was boss Henry Bowen Anthony, editor and owner of the Providence Journal and Senator from 1859 till he died in 1885 or four, I think. Anthony, an ardent xenophobe, railed against the Irish in the pages of his paper and campaigned to keep the newcomers politically silent. So in the North American Review, I, I thought I would give you a little taste of his, um, his uh, venom. The, the immigrant from Europe is not largely composed of the most intelligent and cultivated classes, so he says. The immigrants have come to us from the almshouses and prisons of Europe are admitted to the full rights of American citizenship before they have been in the country long enough to have learned to perjure themselves in intelligent English, nasty. He has not been inducted into the Rhode Island Heritage Hall of Fame. <laughs> no, no. He and his Protestant cohort succeeded in maintaining a political hold on the state in some fashion for nearly 80 years. Their effort figured prominently in the political battle between Democrats and Republicans. Rhode Island's reluctance to accept Irish Catholics didn't dissuade them from the most, most uh, tenacious from establishing re residence in the state regardless of its unwelcoming social and economic environment. Most of them came either through New York or Boston before the opening of the Port of Providence through the Faber Line in 1911. Then they all gravitated to the urban centers such as Providence, Newport, Pawtucket, Central Falls, Lincoln, Cumberland, and Woonsocket, as Woonsocket in the 19th century. Because of the crowding of the Irish, the native inhabitants, active in state government engineered a proactive response to ensure that the newcomers would remain in low paying employment and substandard living conditions. The nativists endured, ensured that the Irish, the, I'm sorry, the Anglo-Saxon community would retain dominance politically by superficially encouraging constitutional reform when in reality, they upheld what they call a rotten borough system. So, you know, the urban, the urban uh, wards would have probably uh, either less or the same as the rural wards, maybe with a population of 5,000 versus some place like Providence that has a population of 40,000. So that's how they sort of retained it. And they also had a property qualification clause that said, if you owned $134.70 worth of property, that's the only way you could vote. So if you're an Irish immigrant and you're living in a tenement, you can't vote. The unfortunate scars of racial and ethnic exclusion against Irish Catholics would haunt James J., his brothers, and most notably his son, J. Howard, throughout his life. As historians Kirby Miller and Paul Wagner point out, even those immigrants who achieved security or success in the United States passed on to the children and grandchildren a heritage tinged with bitterness. On the other hand, the tenacity of the Irish also strengthened McGrath's spirit and guided his future political career. This duality helps to explain why second generation Irish American politicians like J. Howard McGrath were resolute in their determination to succeed against the domination of Yankee Protestantism in urban America. In addition, McGrath grew, drew strength from his family and friends, even in his later years. James Howard McGrath's paternal ancestry began on the eastern shores of, War of Ireland in Waterford County. Edmund McGrath and his wife, the former Mary Fanning of County Waterford, Ireland, with their sons, John, James, Jay, Thomas, and Patrick, boarded the ship Kansas from Queenstown, Ireland, Bound for the United States, they docked in Liverpool. Then they arrived in Boston on June 3rd, 1887. By this time, travel had become less grueling. So instead of three weeks to travel, now it only took maybe between 10 and 14 days and the cost was less. 
disembarking in Boston, Massachusetts, the McGraths found an up and coming industrial center. They left Boston, however, to find employment in the thriving mill. So they came on down through Millville, um, I guess before Route 146, whatever. And then they went to Woonsocket, Rhode Island, um, settled there in 1890. And James was a workaholic. And his wife said he sold insurance 24 hours a day. I'm sure she would, probably wasn't too happy with that, but whatever the case, um, he was employed by the Glenark Mills in Woonsocket, and he soon became supervisor and joined the Knitters Labor Union to petition for better hours and wages. Following his move to Providence, which um, occurred directly after J. Howard's birth in 1903, um, he was eager to increase his salary, so he joined the Independent Order of Foresters, which is a, a sort of a brotherhood um, a brotherhood society that was um, established in Canada. He served as manager for the Rhode Island and Connecticut branches, later becoming one of the most energetic insurance agents. Well respected by his peers, he also became active as a member of the Democratic Party in the 10th Ward. Now, maternal ancestry um, of J. Howard McGrath took um, sort of a, a little roundabout route. Ida May McGrath's father, John Gideon May, immigrated to New York City 15 years before the McGrath brothers left Ireland, born in River John, Pictou County, Nova Scotia, on October 3rd, 1846. John Gideon was, on, was the sixth of seven children and the second of three sons of William Mayhe, this was an age, and Elizabeth Catherine Carmichael, and the Carmichaels, I guess, were a very uh, influential family in Pictou County. Arriving in New York in 1871 on a ship owned by the Portland Steamship Company, John married Mary Ann McCarthy in New York City on June 25th, 1872. So Mary and John, J. Howard's maternal grandparents, gave birth to 10 children, eight of whom survived to adulthood. Their second child, Ida Eleanor May, McGrath's, uh, McGrath's mother, was born on January 3rd, 1875 in Providence and worked as a stenographer before she married 28-year-old James J. McGrath. And they were married by Father Thomas McGee at St. Joseph's Church in Providence, Rhode Island on September 5th, 1901. So wasting um, no time, they had their first child on June 15th, 1902 with James Howard, their second son following on November 28th, 1903. And he was born in Woonsocket. So as the son of Irish immigrants, uh, when Socket born McGrath learned from his father the importance of securing a place in America's social order. He'd accompany his dad on trips, and they said he could make a stump speech by the time he was 14. Um, so, yeah. So while other kids were out playing and, you know, roughhousing around Providence, McGrath was either working, he sold apples when he was five or six, uh, he worked at Presby's, he did all sorts of things to earn money for his family. And he, he just literally never stopped. Um, so he and his fellow classmates, by the time he went, uh, before I say that, he went to LaSalle Academy, followed the route of a Catholic, Irish Catholic boy in Providence. He went to LaSalle Academy, and then he went to Providence College. Um, and while he was there, he and his fellow classmate, Gail Sullivan, um, organized the Young Democrats of Rhode Island while they both attended Providence College. They also were part of the debate team and I guess they kind of went to Fordham and sat in the back, learned all the strategies and then brought it, brought it back to Providence College and defeated them at Fordham. Sorry if any of you are Fordham grads. Acting as its first president, J. Howard McGrath is one of the first official duties endorsed Lieutenant Governor Felix Tupin on behalf of the organization. So he graduates from Providence College in 1926, and he enrolls at Boston University's uh, School of Law and captured the attention of Senator Peter Gary when he placed second in a statewide contest. McGrath loved contests. I think he loved contests more than actually serving in the positions that he did. Um, so the newly purchased Providence News, they held a subscription, you know, who could sell the most subscriptions? He came in second. Miss Ida McKay or whatever her name was. She was first, but nobody knows who she is. She gets the Cadillac, he gets the Packard, but then he becomes governor, so who wins? 
The elder McGrath, who saw his young offspring, the, make, the, uh, yeah, the makings of a modern uh, political future, secured 4,000 new subscribers for the independent order of foresters. So he wins, as I said, wins the uh, contest and Senator Gary uh, takes note of him, takes him under his wing and he becomes part of the organization. That is known as the Providence Organization because the Democratic Party was sort of split into three or four different factions and McGrath had ended up being in the most important faction because they had the most money. Senator Peter Gary pretty much financed a lot of the elections and so forth. Now the car that McGrath won was probably about $3,800 then. It's probably about worth about $60,000 today, um, just to figure. Anyway, um, his friendship and, connect and con yeah, connections forged while a student at PC and then Boston University coupled with the ties he secured from the role of the independent order of foresters uh, really helped build a base for him when he starts his political career. He solidifies his ties with the Blackstone Valley after his graduation from BU Law School by marrying um, Estelle Cataret, who, whose father was a political voice in Central Falls. He eventually becomes mayor. And um, that's how he sort of has ties there. So. Anyway, my next, how am I doing on time? Let's see. Am I beyond? I'm good? All right, I'm good. Okay, <laughs> thank you. So um, what I wanted to concentrate on was the earth. <laughs> oh, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> I could sing maybe, but maybe not. I used to be able to whistle, but not anymore. <laughs> anyway, so there he is as a young man in school. There's Peter Gary. There he is with Theodore Francis Green. Um, McGrath forms, he really gets in with the um, most important, I don't wanna say most important, I wanna say probably most lucrative um, faction of the Democratic Party. There's Peter Gary uh, on my left. And um, he was actually a Tammany Hall recruit. He had a big, big old mansion in Manhattan, really nice. And I don't know if you've ever heard the name, Elbridge Gary, you know, signer of the Declaration of Independence. That was his great, great grandfather. So Peter Gary was actually the first um, Senator elected under the new law, which made the election of senators um, directly rather than than the way it had been before through the House of Representatives. So, uh, so he had earned quite a bit of um, you know, money, number one, and power, number two, with his organization. And McGrath, as a young man, was part of that organization. Senator the Theodore Francis Green actually turned out to be more of a mentor to McGrath than uh, Peter Gary, but they both were, certainly. So here's some of the other parts of the um, factions, and that's Tom McCoy of Pawtucket or the Blackstone Valley. And down below is where they, Colonel Patrick Quinn. And um, he is of the Patuxet Valley of the Apennine area. And um, yeah, there was some rousing fights. We're gonna concentrate on one of those rousing fights today uh, because Patrick Quinn really did not like um, Peter Gary. At one point, he accused him of being part of the KKK, which I, there's no law of that. But anyway, needless to say, um, McGrath kind of serves as the uh, first line of defense for Gary and Green. But even so, the infighting that happened with the Democratic Party threatened to really unravel any kind of um, any kind of forward thinking and whatever that they had they had achieved at that point. Um, now, by the 1930s, <coughs> excuse me. Sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> anyway, um, by the 1930s, we're in the we're in the middle midst of a depression, and in most other most other states that had democratic parties, they had sort of achieved some in you know something <clears throat> by the time the 1920s and 30s happened. Um, not Rhode Island because of the, all these crazy laws that were happening. So McGrath is sort of on the ground floor and 
these other two, you know, they were all fighting uh, amongst themselves. So what we'll say here is that um, as green biographer Erwin Levine would later note, McGrath's admonishment of the party ranks and file streamlined the organization and deflected negative attention from Green. However, Green often found himself soothing ruffled feathers on all fronts as Gary and another Tammany Hall recruit, uh, General Henry DeWitt Hamilton, uh, from basically, and McGrath launching full frontal assault against the other factions of the party. Um, so McGrath is carrying out the wishes of his sometimes controversial mentor, Peter Gary. He alienated, <coughs> excuse me, some of the more vocal Irish Americans, such as Colonel Patrick Quinn and um, his nephew fighting Bob Quinn, and of course, um, Tom McCoy. So at the same time that the, all this was happening, the Republicans began to redraw the state map to again secure Republican dominance because they see all the Irish coming. And by the time some of the generation had happened, some of these Irish were able to vote because they had achieved some property or what have you. So the Republicans wanted to redraw the map. And basically um, the more important provisions of each state and four Senate districts in Providence and transferred a representative, a representative um, from traditionally democratic strongholds of Newport, Central Falls and Boroughville to Republican dominated Cranston, East Providence and Warwick. So then the Republican measure was gonna increase the wards of Providence from 10 to 13. So on March 21st, there's McGrath um, and six Democrats are conspicuously absent from the role. The Republicans were able to secure the measure and basically secure their measures and keep the Democrats out. At this point, McGrath is still vice chairman. He had become chairman of the Democratic State Committee in 1930. So he was at this point just sort of changing over, but he's still vice chairman and uh, at a North Providence Democratic club meeting the next day, McGrath lambastes them. Now he's the youngest vice chairman probably in the nation. And when he becomes chairman, he's also the youngest. So he's pretty young. Um, and you can see by his outbursts why maybe some experience might've been good for him. Because what he does is he lambastes them, calling them traitors. Now these were seasoned Democrats accepting bribes from Republican state chairman, William Pelkey. That's what he accuses them of. This was called his speech of stigmatism against the errant six who were sick. So one of them really takes offense. Well, not just one, but this was the one I liked the best. So I kind of put this one in. More seasoned veterans who were accused took exception to the young Democrat, J. Frank Sullivan, who was a World War I vet, a representative in good standing since 1923. And he says of McGrath, McGrath is a political hack, making his livelihood working for a private political machine. He said, I was sick in bed with pneumonia. My physicians didn't know what my illness was, but feared it was pneumonia. So McGrath then works his way into my bedroom and like a whipped cur, delivered his speech to the North Providence gathering on my, you know, at my expense. And Sullivan drew basically saying this in front of the General Assembly, never in my eight years in this house have I arisen to speak on a point of personal privilege, but this matter is one that cannot be overlooked. This contemptible creature McGrath would rue the day he challenged me. Nasty, another nasty. So this is, do you think politics is nasty today? It was really, it was nasty, yeah. However, it was entertaining. Um, McGrath continued to provoke ire within the ranks of the, fi uh, of the uh, local election. Um, and for my last thing that I'll say here, uh, Mary Keenan, sister of the recently deceased Gary Alley, Luke Keenan, she's gonna hold a, a, a local election. And of course now there's McGrath micromanaging every election. So he goes into Johnston, Rhode Island, and uh, there's some, Italian folks there that were getting a little hot under the collar, feeling that the Irish and some of the um, native Democrats uh, played favorites. So in a comic tragic 
turn of events, Mary Keenan, who's Luke's sister, she's going to vote. And of course, McGrath says, I'm for Mary, first, last, and always. Um, she holds the election in her home. She waits 30 minutes to open the door. And meanwhile, everybody's just seething with anger. You know, they, they want to vote. Uh, who does she think she is? That sort of thing. As soon as the doors open, chaos. In the process of stuffing ballot boxes, here in Rhode Island, oh my, that doesn't happen. Anyway, um, one woman was pummeled to death with a lethal pocketbook. Uh, another one was knocked unconscious and, and ballots were all over the place, lying on the front lawn. 500 people were turned away from the caucus, unable to cast their ballots. Equally disturbing though, as far as this other is, again, a little bit um, entertaining, it does send a certain message that the Yankee block of the party was indifferent to all but a small group of elite supporters and illustrated the growth of state power in America. Did McGrath abandon his Irish roots? Whether they knew it or not, localized politics, though important to the democratic coalition to come, was losing ground to the more centralized, efficient state machine. So now, oops, we'll go back here. Um, thank goodness for Theodore Francis Green, who kind of moves McGrath away from the controversy and instead focuses on the declaration of principles of the Democratic Party against the economic turmoil of the Great Depression. So let's focus on restructuring state government, eliminating unnecessary bureaucracy, establishing state-funded elderly pensions, equitable provisions for workmen's compensation, and repeal of prohibition, the most important one. Green's plan outlined a set of attainable goals and minimized the petty squabbles, um, that now it's sending a different message that e we can have economic recovery and not petty squabbles. Um, Green eventually does this by appointing some members of the Patuxent Valley, um, for example, Luigi Di Pasquale, as Providence Sixth District Court Judge, and fighting Bob Quinn as his running mate during the successful gubernatorial bid in 1932, and that's Green. So McGrath takes his sort of uh, cue from Theodore Francis Green, and they move from Al Smith, who was a Gary supporter, and vice versa, to Franklin Roosevelt, who would win the 1932 election. So in conclusion, I tell my students best two words in the English language. In conclusion, McGrath clung to his Irish roots in good times and in bad. The connection served him well, but occasionally, well, did not shield him from his shortcomings because it helps him to avoid accepting responsibility for his actions. He blames the bigotry of others, especially later in his career, and while probably true to some extent, but maybe it wasn't the whole story. So in, here he is as uh, governor, which we can talk about a bit. There, there's a familiar picture. Harry Truman that McGrath as Democratic National Chairman helps to foster that victory in 1948. Um, there he is as Attorney General. So I'm gonna close this by bringing us to April of 1950 when Attorney General Howard McGrath was nearing the end of his long and impressive career, Democratic State Chairman, US District Attorney, Governor, Solicitor General, Senator, Democratic National Chairman, and now US Attorney General. He owed his many accomplishments to his Irish Catholic roots, instilled in him by his stoic, hardworking parents, James and Ida. Now as the new decade commenced, McGrath at age 47, was honored by the Reverend Father John A. Elbert, Provincial of the Eastern Province of the Society of Mary with the Medal of Mary. Accordingly, the distinction named McGrath the highest ranking Catholic layman in the United States government for his outstanding service to his fellow man. According to McGrath, writing to J. Edgar Hoover, 
The honor fills me with a deep humility and the earnest hope that I shall never be able to live up to. Does McGrath live up to the principles of the Society of Mary? Well, one fact is certain, James Howard McGrath valued his Irish Catholic roots and turned to them in his hour of need and would forever be Jim McGrath's boy. Thank you. Yeah, he's not too happy in that picture. <laughs> so we have questions, right? Another great slice of Rhode Island ever, right? Thank you. Yeah. Now, would you entertain questions? Of course. Great. I will walk with the microphone for anyone that has a question for Dr. Deb. Yes, I'm part of Jerry, so yes. <laughs> he doesn't need a mic. <laughs> there was an incredible cavalcade of uh, Irish American politicians at that particular moment in time. They were everywhere, and one seemed to supersede the other. Um, I'm just wondering. Some like John Fogarty kept his Irish roots intact physically by visiting the old country and having that back and forth. But I, I didn't catch any of that. Um, he went. Graph. Did he do that too, or was that? Well, not often, but he went in 1947. Um, when he was senator, right before he became a uh, Democratic national chairman, he. He visited Ireland and um, because there were displaced persons. After World War II, there were displaced persons. So he was on the committee um, to kind of figure out. So before he went on a sort of on a European tour to visit, I mean, he went to uh, Italy and a lot of the places, Germany, all these places. And these displaced camps, you literally, you had uh, Jewish folks in with their Nazi captives next to each other for up to 10 years. Um, but before he did that, he visited Ireland. That's the only time that I actually saw that there were, you know, and this woman was like sort of wishing him off or whatever, you know. But yeah, he went there then. I don't know how, how long, though. Hmm. I don't hope that answers your question. <laughs> Other questions? I'm not familiar with, with Mr. McGrath, but his background seems more impressive than any of the presidents that I've been alive to witness. So what did this guy do wrong? Ooh. Um, Does anyone know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, there's a lot of theories. Um, Again, they, you know, they're not going to probably outline them, but, but when he became, I don't know, I guess I want to say that when he was governor of Rhode Island, he did a really a, a very uh, fantastic job, I think, you know, he, for example, temporary disability insurance, if anyone's ever had an experience where Rhode Islanders can get temporary disability insurance, you can thank McGrath because there was something called cash sickness in 1942. It was actually a pilot program. Juvenile court, which becomes the, the family court in 1961, also McGrath under him, you know, um, absentee balloting, you name so many uh, different pieces of legislation. So he goes, but he really wants to be on the national scene. So that drive, that ambition doesn't make him kind of cultivate the positions and kind of look introspectively at what what was going on. He would always blame other people if there was a problem or or if he was crossed in any way. Um, that and when he was Democratic chairperson, he got into the national stage. And in the national stage, Harry Truman has a lot of I mean, he's a good president, but had a lot of cronies, people from Missouri who were his close confidants. And in that respect, McGrath wasn't sort of in the in crowd, I guess. And that being the fact that when he, they made him attorney general, he really wanted to be Supreme Court judge. He was drinking excessively. 
um, from all the sources that I read and what I hear outside of the sources um, from hearsay, and also the fact that he was letting all sorts of things go. There was so much corruption in the Department of Justice and the Department of Treasury. That that's sort of another talk, I guess. But um, but it what happens is he just dismisses it, dismisses crime. You know, so I teach, I actually teach a course on gangsters in my school, and we would just had that, and we were talking about the fact that the federal government said, there's no such thing as a mafia. And then Estes Kefauver went on national television and said, guess what, there is. So, so all of those things combined, I don't know if that really answers your question, but, you know, a lot of all of that, um, I think, doesn't lend itself to a lot of introspection on his part. Um, and he sort of let a lot of things go. I don't think he was really into the position of being attorney general. I really think he wanted to be Supreme Court justice. Hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Tran. Thanks, Mike. Debbie, this is really interesting. Um, <laughs> you know, when you were mentioning him being the Supreme Court justice, that, I was wondering about that, because in the 50s, there was this big push to get a Catholic on the Supreme Court. And of course, that's going to be William Brennan, mm -hmm. right? So he's going to get that seat. And then, but there was a fight between Brennan and then Clarence Mannion from Notre Dame. And, but he must have been in the mix as well, I'm guessing, just from what, you, what yeah. you're saying. So when Frank, when Frank Murphy dies in 1951, Oh, 19, maybe it was 19, I'm sorry, 1949. McGrath thought, oh, I'm next because I'm the next Catholic. You know, remember me, you know. And also in 1946, when all the Democrats were losing, um, he was one of the few that who actually won in 46 as a senator. And he figures by, oh, you know, I'm in. I, I'm going to be, I'm going to be the next guy because look at, you know, what happened with the, with the election and so forth. And Truman was grateful, um, but not that grateful, I guess. So what happened was that um, instead his, his crony, Tom Clark gets the Supreme Court position. And in order to balance the Catholic vote, he gives McGrath attorney general. So he's not, and this I, I blame sort of on Truman and people of that period that you're, you're um, awarding political positions to people who maybe they weren't ready or willing or able or whatever for that position. So that's where I think, I don't know. Yeah. So as far as, but he never, I mean, he never entertained that. After 1952, he was disgraced. So there was no talk of anything. He tried to run for the um, Senate in 1960. And we know that Claiborne Pell won at that point. And McGrath got like 5,000 votes. He was dead last. So, you know, yeah. There was a gentleman here, I think, who had a question. This gentleman? I just wanted to comment that as far as Rhode Island is concerned, I think he was an owner or founder or both of Bonnet Shores Beach Club. Yes. Do you want to hear a story? <laughs> There's, a, I have a story for everything. Yeah. So apparently this guy, I think his name was Alex Ray. I don't know if you have, I don't know who he is, but he, he used to, it was a little boy and he would uh, travel with his cousin, just walk up and down Bonnet Shores, you know, Sunnybrook Farm is with, with the name. That's where he actually entered, McGrath entertained the Duke and Duchess of Windsor. Um, but anyway, this boy, Alex Ray goes walking up and he's about seven years old. So he comes up, and I guess they were neighbors or whatever. So he comes up, and he sees the great senator, J. Howard McGrath, and he says, I'm thirsty. So McGrath turns to him and says, why don't you try this? The this was some sort of, he spits it out, and apparently was some sort of liquor. He said, well, my father never took me there again. Because he said, if you want to be a politician, you have to learn how to hold your liquor. Yeah, so that's McGrath the Bonnet Shores. <laughs> Is that it for questions? Yeah. 
one of our Zoom guests from home, um, from John Murphy, he comments that uh, McGrath and his wife adopted a son who had been living in state custody. You, there may be a little story with that. Yeah, um, that's David. I actually talked to David in 1985. Um, of course, I don't remember what he said. <laughs> you know, age. Anyway, um, so I talked to him and he died in 2012. So there's a big shroud of craziness that goes on with this. Uh, might have something to do with Ireland. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, um, as to McGrath's adopted son, I, I'm not really sure because there's no, there was no record, you know, whether they were sealed records or what have you because they're adopted. But I actually... <laughs> The joy of Facebook, I found his grandson on Facebook, Brian McGrath, and we sort of converse. And he, I sent him my book, you know, and um, he said, boy, I could tell you some stories, but I'm not sure what they are. Anyway, um, so, so yeah, so di I did get to talk with David, and I tried to talk with his sisters. No, his, I'm sorry, were they his sisters? Yeah, they were her sisters, but they kept canceling on me, so I never was able to talk with them. So he has, I believe, two sisters who are still living. Um, no, nieces, nieces. They would be now, of course, his nieces. Um, and I talked to Mr. Kilgus in 1985, too, um, his executive secretary. Yeah. Anyone else? Hope I didn't put anybody to sleep. <laughs> I always ask that of my students. If I hear no snoring, I figured I've done well. <laughs> we owe you a huge thanks. Oh, thank you so thank much. You so much. Thank you, everyone. Do folks have any questions? I guess you can go there. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was interesting the way you said um, those people in Missouri. Like, I've heard the people in Missouri say, those people in Rhode Island. Oh, I, <laughs> I shouldn't say that because I love Missouri. Yeah. I met, how many, my husband's back there, and he, and he would know how many summers we spent in Missouri. Yeah, yeah like thank you so left. much. <laughs> Again. On your way out, they are serving food, uh, appetizers out in the lobby, and Please say happy 52nd wedding anniversary to Rosemary and Richard Danforth. Thank you.